everybody welcome welcome thank you so much for coming out to our event tonight we had a couple little technical problems had a slight delay so thank you for sticking with us my name is kelly joe brick i'm the vice chair of the wga genre committee who's bringing you this event tonight um, our committee meets uh, every other month and we talk about all things genre from horror to sci-fi to comedy. We would love to have you come join us. Our next meeting is coming up uh, on the second Tuesday in October. And uh, before we get started, I wanted to send out a few thank yous. First of all, to our panelists who are joining us tonight. I uh, look forward to hearing all the science uh, insights that they have to share with us and inspire us as creatives. Big thank you also to Greg, our guild liaison for helping putting these events together. And then a huge, huge thank you to Spiro Skentos. He is uh, the uh, moderator for tonight. He is the former uh, co-chair of the genre committee. And years ago, he helped found this event that we became an annual event for us because everyone just got so um, loved all the things they have gotten out of it, talking about futurism and bringing in experts to help us out. Uh, so a little bit about Spiro. He is a science lover himself and a big supporter of, of genre and genre writers across the board. Uh, he's got credits on shows like Arrow, Grimm, and has some projects in development right now. So uh, Spiro, the night is yours. Thank you, Kelly Joe. That's really nice. I appreciate that. Hey, everyone. Uh, so I'm Spiro Skensos. I'm your moderator, and thanks for showing up tonight. Uh, I also want to say a big thanks to Genre Committee. I sure do miss seeing all my peeps IRL. Um, thanks to Dwayne and Kelly Joe. Thanks to Communications Department. And again, special big thanks to Greg Mitchell. He's our guild liaison who is beyond. So please, a round of applause at home for him. He's been so great putting this together. Uh, so tonight, we will present four 10 to 15 minute lectures with a Q&A at the end of this uh, whole thing. So you'll be able to ask Q&A to the entire group, not just to uh, one person. I also wanna send out a big uh, digital thank you to the Science and Entertainment Exchange. We collaborated with them for this panel and Sachi and Rick there were amazing in getting us today's lineup. The Science and Entertainment Exchange is a program of the National Academy of Sciences which connects the entertainment industry with experts in science, technology, and medicine in order to enhance the portrayal of science and scientists in film, TV, and new media, and to make science more accessible and inspiring for all audiences. If you're looking for a scientist or an engineer to help with the project for free, call them at 844-NEED-SCI or the exchange at nas.edu, and we'll put that into the chat. So here we are on Zoom because of the continuing gift of COVID and that continued today when we had two of our speakers drop out last minute because of work and personal situations. And we have two amazing scientists who have stepped in at the last minute to be part of tonight. And I'm so grateful for that. See, science saved the day. Uh, so our first one is, our first speaker is Jamie Mrock who has 20 years experience in pharma and biotech developing medicines. She currently works for a contract manufacturing organization that develops vaccines, antibodies, and other medicines, where she oversees a large group of chemists, microbiologists, and technical writers. Her presentation is Leveraging a Global Pandemic. And Jamie, thank you so much for being here and welcome and take it away. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for being here. Um, I'm going to get my screen shared here for my talk. And let's see what happens if I go to full slideshow mode. Okay. Looks good. If there's any challenges with seeing my talk. Um, so thank you for the nice introduction, Spiro. And I'm honored to be uh, a part of this evening. As uh, Spiro mentioned, I currently work for a contract manufacturing organization that's part of the biotech industry essentially companies who have vaccines or antibody treatments to develop and manufacture hire us to support them because they don't have the capabilities in-house such as sterile manufacturing abilities. Um, 
the company I work for is located in San Diego. And just due to the last minute nature of this, um, I, I left the company name out so I don't have to seek approval. Um, I also represent the Science and Entertainment Exchange and I'm happy to provide free advice on anyone's project if ever needed. So um, I'm excited to talk to you about an element of COVID-19 that we don't hear about as often in the news. Um, at this point, we're all sick to death of hearing about the pandemic, but let's just start from the same baseline as Wikipedia defines for us that a pandemic is an epidemic of an infectious disease in particular. Uh, for example, cancer is widespread across the globe, but it's not infectious, so it's not considered a pandemic. This infectious disease is um, usually across multiple continents over a substantial number of people and is different than a widespread disease that has a stable number of infected people. So this is one that's rapidly spreading and increasing. Some current pandemics, although we only hear about COVID-19 right now, tuberculosis and HIV AIDS are also considered global pandemics. Some famous pandemics that we may have heard about in history class or even on the news recently are the, the Black Death or the plague in the 14th century and the Spanish flu from about 100 years ago. And the most recent famous movie example that I could think of that a lot of us are familiar with was Contagion. That was also a global pandemic. It was initiated by a bat pig situation in which it uh, got transferred to human and their solution was a vaccine, just like with COVID-19 that we hear about all the time. So translating this more specifically to the COVID-19 pandemic, although we use the term COVID-19 all the time, the virus is SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2 that causes coronavirus disease 2019, hence the naming COVID-19. It's genetically related to the 2003 SARS outbreak that we had heard about, so that's why it shares the naming. It's a single-stranded RNA virus. We often talk in the population the most about our own genetic encoding of double-stranded DNA. Um, RNA is also genetic code that, that we carry and it's one single strand. So this is an RNA virus. Coronavirus were, were first identified in the 1960s, but they are thought to have been around for centuries. And the best offense, just like we're doing with COVID-19, is mass vaccination. We've all heard the news ad nauseum for FDA emergency use authorization for the two vaccines that we've been using, which is the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, collaboration, which actually received full approval today, so it's no longer EUA, and the Johnson & Johnson single dose vaccine. What we really don't hear about on the news very much that I think is a really interesting science story are the lesser known treatments for COVID-19. So the vaccine is meant to prevent serious disease before you are infected. Uh, these treatments are meant to improve your symptoms if you've already been infected with COVID-19. Um, monoclonal antibodies are the way that we do these treatments. I'm gonna talk to you guys more about how that works today. Humans have the ability to generate one quintillion different antibodies. So this is a really neat machinery we already possess that we can capitalize on to create therapies to treat patients. Um, the diversity amongst different people for that ability to generate one quintillion antibodies is what one needs to capitalize on as we'll talk about because everyone would make a little bit different version of the antibody that would be more or less effective when they uh, first become infected. In the case of SARS-CoV-2, I'm not sure if it lets me use the pointer, but I will attempt it in case you guys can see it. Um, this is a representation of the virus and it has 
four major structural proteins that can be helpful when creating a medicine. The first one they call the spike protein. It's these little spiky red pieces that stick out all over this spherical structure. The second one is the envelope protein, which is this little yellow pin in the representation. An envelope protein, um, oh, sorry, yeah, the envelope protein is the little yellow pin. The membrane is this gray U. It's a, a protein embedded in this fatty cell membrane or a nucleocapsid one, which is actually what traps the, that RNA inside. The vast majority of antibody therapies for COVID-19 target this red spiky piece sticking out. So the antibody would bind to that spike and that's how it would be effective. These are for COVID positive patients, as we mentioned, that are at a high risk of severe disease and hospitalization. Um, if you get to them in time, it can reduce the risk of hospitalization and delay disease progression. An analogy is it's really like being treated with the antibodies of a formerly infected individual who had made very effective antibodies. Another um, maybe entertaining but gross analogy that we sometimes hear about in the news with uh, flashy but simple medicine are fecal transplants. So we, we often hear, um, for example, irritable bowel syndrome patients who struggle with maintaining a healthy gut flora can receive a fecal transplant from a patient that has a healthy gut flora of um, you know, a microbiome or bacteria, healthy bacteria in their gut you can um, actually remove that via feces, clean it all up so it's not literally putting feces into another patient, but you're able to transfer that immune system and bacteria from a, a healthy patient to a less healthy patient. It's really not that different that you're capitalizing on someone who's healthy and whose body is, is really um, made a stronger case for this than you. So we just do this on a bigger scale in, in science and in medicine. Uh, so there's, uh, you may not even realize there's actually three COVID antibody uh, treatments on the market right now through FDA emergency use authorization. And I've listed them here. It's a uh, bamlanivimab plus atesivimab. Those are both two spike proteins, although it was paused in June, 2021 because they were less effective against the newer variants of COVID-19. The second one is casirivimab plus imdevimab, also to a spike protein. This one got some press because um, former President Trump acquired COVID and was treated with this and sang its praises in the news. That's really the only time I know I personally heard about antibody treatment on the news. The third one is sotrovimab also to spike protein. And then there are many others in development as part of the US Department of Defense and Operation Work Speed projects, including um, four, four projects at the company that I work for as, as part of those efforts. Um, these antibodies may be ineffective against new variants. They can be still effective. One just needs to check for that. For example, one of the programs that my company has that's a three antibody cocktail for treatment has been demonstrated in the lab to be effective against the Delta variant. So don't, don't take the fact that they can be sensitive to variants as an automatic negative. Some of them are still um, perfectly effective. And uh, they do need to be given early in disease onset in order to be effective. And they are through IV infusion, which is a little bit less convenient. Uh, so let's go through very quickly how do monoclonal antibodies work. The best example, uh, thanks to Spiro, that is accessible to all of us is actually a Wired article. They did a, a great job in that magazine of going through how this works. And so I, would, I included some quotes today from that article. The inspiration for these COVID-19 antibody treatments really comes from HIV. With HIV, uh, they had noticed that 
some patients did not become severely ill and it's because they had stronger antibody responses. They lived longer lives, which is really cool observation and they could capitalize on it for medicine. So uh, according to the article, they had to find HIV patients that had been infected for years, but remained relatively healthy. Then from those people, they collected and analyzed blood samples to find out if the donors were among the estimated 1% of people, only 1% who made the most highly effective antibodies. Then they processed that blood to separate out the antibody producing B cells and then tested those out in a cell line in the lab that had been exposed to HIV to see if the antibodies would prevent infection. They could choose the strongest candidates to become medical treatment from that. Uh, because we often hear HIV is very fastly mutating, um, and also because the semi-famous three anti or three drug cocktail, not antibodies, three drug cocktail came out to slow the progression of HIV. That really cool research for HIV antibodies was not applied yet. They didn't end up um, getting their medicine on the market but that same technology can be leveraged and was immediately leveraged for COVID-19. So over 100 antibody drugs have arrived on the market in the US or the EU. About half are for fighting cancer, which can be immune system mediated as well. Um, most of the rest against autoimmune disordered disorders, very few against infectious disease. Only seven have ever been approved by the FDA the earliest in 1998 for a lung infection, and then 20 years later for Ebola. It's really neat we could leverage this for COVID. So similar to the HIV effort, when US cases first emerged, they found a patient who had recovered, collected their blood, analyzed it, and screened more than 5 million cells to find 500 antibodies in five days. Uh, this led to the current situation of more than 40 efforts amongst different companies to produce antibody treatments for COVID. The first of which started with the US Vaccine Research Center who did that blood screening and with the biotech company called Eli Lilly. That's one of the three that I mentioned several slides ago as an antibody treatment. Then the second one being Regeneron, which was the uh, treatment by Donald Trump. Many biotechnology companies are doing R&D to get their effective COVID-19 treatment on the market as soon as possible. And again, collaborating with contract organizations like the company that I work for who can scale up, manufacture, test, and help them get this to market. And also really neat for everyone out there who doesn't work on the work at one of these companies is the unprecedented speed at which this is happening. It's been a really neat opportunity to look at what is enough to get a drug to market without compromising patient safety. It generates a lot of really interesting philosophical discussions. Um, so just to recap, as I mentioned, my company has four different COVID projects. Um, one of which is the three antibody cocktail that is effective against the Delta variant. So it's been really fun and interesting to work on that. Of course, in human struggles and this COVID-19 pandemic, there's fuel for storytelling for all of you guys for your creative minds and can just run with that. Uh, these lesser known medical advances for COVID-19 could be leveraged to create interesting storytelling. As I mentioned, antibodies for COVID-19 treatment are not well known other than the time that uh, former President Donald Trump mentioned being ill with COVID-19 and sang the praises of the treatment on the news. One interesting article that I came across in my research as well for this talk is uh, pasted here from the NIH. It's a very deep scientific talk, but someone actually went through the theory on if contagion was approached, not just with the vaccine approach, but they also used monoclonal antibodies for treatment. How, what would that look like? So for a science nerd like me, that was a fun read. 
Um, and interestingly for me as a scientist, even with this pandemic lasting for about a year and a half and counting, it's been a missed opportunity to educate the public on how just the basics of virus infection work. I think it's something to think about for um, writers and filmmakers that you know they can keep their storyline interesting while still educating the public um, to respect the science, respect the medicine, so they can be better equipped to approach their daily life. For example, we all know about that initial scandal where the CDC said masks are not needed and not helpful, and then they reversed course. That was would have been well known that masks were needed. Um, I think a lot of the conspiracy theories that have been acknowledged are that there weren't going to be enough masks. And so they um, didn't want to say that masks were needed in the beginning so that healthcare workers wouldn't be shorted. But the result is uh, confusion by the general public on whether or not they're helpful. It's also really not well known that the vaccine does not prevent infection or transmission to other people. The vaccine only prevents development of serious illness after becoming infected. Um, I hear folks, even scientists who aren't in the details telling me all the time, oh, it's perfectly safe to be around me I'm, because I'm vaccinated. Actually, it's not. Um, I wish that it were, I have a 95 year old grandmother who I have to be very careful with um, because she's not vaccinated and we need to use herd immunity to protect her. There are lots of real life inspiring scientists, researcher, medical and human stories here to tell. This type of concept could be leveraged for um, any sort of virus or infectious disease that you might dream up in your science fiction or in your documentaries. And um, in conclusion, uh, scientists like myself are here to support and advise you if you have any questions I did for convenience, just include a link to the Science and Entertainment Exchange at the bottom. And I, I believe we're doing questions at the end in the panel. So definitely let me know if, if any questions or clarification at that time. And thanks again for letting me be here. Jamie, that was so amazing. Thank you. That was really great. Uh, I can't believe how quickly you were able to put that together for us on short notice. Uh, thanks so much. I don't know if you're able from your PowerPoint, if you're able to cut and paste the links and put them into the chat for everyone on your end, if you can do that. And if you can't, we'll find another sure. way to get them, but that would be really helpful. Really helpful. Um, thank you for that. Um, all right, uh, coming up next, you guys, we have Justin Johnson is a graduate from Stanford in computer science and is now the product general manager for T0 Markets and Crypto which specializes in tech behind stock and currency trading. Uh, his lecture is on blockchain, which he's going to give us now. And just as a reminder, uh, he is one of our superheroes for the day who was able to come in last minute. Uh, we did not ex uh, ask him or expect him to have any sort of uh, uh, PowerPoint ready. Uh, so we're just thrilled to have him and he's gonna uh, tell us all about that. So thank you, Justin. Thank you, Spiro. Um... Yeah, on that note, uh, please put questions in the chat or in the QA, QA, probably better. <laughs> that way I can uh, address them as we go along here. Um, we can make it a little bit more uh, uh, interactive also because uh, I do have a hard stop, so I may not be able to join into the, the formal QA session later. So please uh, participate as I go along here. Um, as creatives and as writers, um, we hear about blockchain, we're thinking about things that are super technical, but that's not what blockchain is really about. Um, so I'm going to give you a question, and I think, and now what you really think about that question, um, when you think about writing and writing for the future, that's positive. Uh, the question is, what if we could live in a world where you could trust everyone and everything? So I'll say that again. Uh, the goal that we're trying to reach again, what if we can live in a world where we could trust everything and everyone. And so why is blockchain a part of that? Um, the whole point of the of, uh, uh, blockchain refers to a, a method of technology. And sorry, I don't have slides to kind of uh, break it out here, but uh, a method of technology of taking information 
and, and proving it and establishing it as true at a certain time. And then that information can no longer be changed or edited. Um, if there was an audit to say like, this information is not proven false, it would add itself next into the chain. Um, and then people can audit that trail to see what information is right at any given time. Um, so that is what a, the blockchain is. It, it's timed uh, interactions that are immutable and have been proven to be true at that time. Um, and that's why we can talk about trust or the, 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 not, the ability to not need trust. Um, and so when I talk about blockchain, what I'm really talking about are trustless interaction or, um, and they're trustless because they're public and decentralized. Public meaning everyone can see it at any time, uh, fully auditable by everyone and decentralized meaning there's no uh, party that can control it. So when a lot of people talk about Bitcoin being stamped out because the US and the China Chinese government will make it um, impossible to use, it's really not true because it's a, it's, it's impossible for any one source to, to control it. That, that's what makes it a true blockchain uh, uh, solution. Um, otherwise, what you have are um, hybrid solutions or private solutions or other solutions that mimic things that the blockchain offers, but are not a true purest uh, blockchain solutions. So in order for it to be a pure solution in blockchain, it has to uh, not uh, be controlled by any particular source. Um, so there's no one to trust, essentially. You don't have to trust that the US government's gonna do the right thing, the world will do the right thing uh, by the, the rules that govern that system. Hey, Justin, there is a, a question on the q and I just wanted to direct your attention. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, so, um, I'm going to talk about mining a little bit here, but I want to, while we're, since mining was come up, the uh, question um, that came in, I want to talk about three things, or I'm going to say high level myths um, about uh, cryptocurrency specifically. Because um, again, blockchain is, a, is an underlying technology method, but it's not the, uh, the actual application of everything that we're talking about, or everything that you will see used. Um, so an application of blockchain will be cryptocurrencies, like a Bitcoin or Ethereum or many, many, many other coins that are being created uh, um, as we speak, it's thousands. <laughs> um, but some of the myths that there is that uh, is primarily used for illegal activity. Um, actually, the US dollar is used way more frequently uh, and in higher volumes uh, for illegal and uh, fraudulent activities than any cryptocurrency by far, including Bitcoin and everything um, combined. <laughs> so um, if we really wanted to talk about fraud or uh, illegal activities, we should start by addressing how the US dollar is used. Um, then is it easy, not secure and easy to lose? Um, while it can be, if you think about, uh, uh, particularly if you the Bitcoin example as money in your pocket and you're walking down the street and $100 falls on the ground, uh, the same way that you could lose Bitcoin that in a similar fashion, you know, $100 is now gone, you know, if someone picks it up, maybe they'll give it back to you, maybe not. If you knew the serial number from that $100 bill, you wrote it down and you put it into a bank and the bank said, yeah, the next time we see this $100 bill, we'll let you know. Uh, you know, there's ways to track it, but uh, if you just drop it on the street and someone picked it up and used it, sure. Bitcoin worked the same way. So we're not, it's not any less secure uh, than our current monetary system, essentially. Uh, how we add more security on it is usually uh, by the fact that we, block, Bitcoin is the one implementation of blockchain, but Ethereum and other blockchains uh, have different implementations that allow us to have contracts and intelligent logic um, where we can track and re recredit that uh, that lost funds or lost asset back to the original owner. Um, so again, not all blockchains work the same, not all implementations work the same, and they do have pros and cons to look at. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's any less secure than uh, our current systems. Um, last thing, so getting to the mining piece, um, there's a lot of talk about cryptocurrencies being bad for the environment. And what they're really talking about, again, is a specific implementation that is a, a proof uh, of work type of implementation. Um, and proof of work, if uh, crypto being cryptography, uh, it takes a long time to crack the code, uh, or you have to do some computations to prove that the next block or the next piece of information that's added to the system is verified and true. Um, and you have to grip consensus from around the world before you can make it so. Uh, and so in order to do that, uh, people have made machines really fast uh, and they use a lot of electricity um, in order to do those computations really fast and get the credit for establishing that block, then they get paid. Um, so that's where that 
conversation is coming from. Uh, Bitcoin, because it is the largest, does have a lot of energy packed on that. Uh, however, there are plenty of other chains that are being built right now and developed and starting to gain traction that don't use that kind of model um, and therefore uh, do not require the same electricity requirements or any kind of uh, power requirements to the same degree. Um, so that argument will, close, will soon um, go away as well um, as, as once we have other chains that do other purposes besides Bitcoin, which is more for money purposes. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit more into the mining uh, piece. I uh, so I want to make sure I answer your question. The, so again, um, the way that the blockchain works is information is added to a chain um, and established as true and verified. Um, in order to do that, people, the mining aspect of it is you compute that information. So the mining is really computational work uh, to validate that this information can now be added to the blockchain and proven and, and shared with the rest of the world. Um, and so that's what the mining part of it is blockchain, and that's how they relate together. Um, and then different chains will call it different things, like some Tezos calls it baking. Uh, and then people will find other analogies to call these things, but not every uh, chain calls mining the same thing. So I have another question. Okay, how do we limit environmental issues? Uh, which I was just talking about, we, as a, if you think about technology, nothing stays the same forever, um, especially in, tech, in regards to technology. Um, so you'll see that uh, we will get better and better at the at the the environmental side of it. Another thing to keep in mind is um, it's not sustainable even for the miners, um, right? Because their their electricity bill is very large as well, and uh, any successful business will want to reduce their cost. Um, so that the nature of uh, game theory will force us to uh, more environmentally friendly models that have a lower cost associated with it. Um, and because we can't use things like coal and other things, it's going to be electricity based. So uh, uh, I think that the environmental piece um, is being blown out of proportion. We've uh, I've been speaking to regulators and senators more recently about it, and uh, I don't think it's not the same concern as some of the other global warming impacts that we uh, can actually address right now. Um, because there's plenty of other blockchains that don't use nearly the same amount of power and that are just as viable for our solutions. Uh, I think those are the only two questions. I have a comment, nothing is unbreakable, but uh, only two questions I see, but please let me know uh, if you guys have any other questions. Just start a quick a quick question for you. Your earlier question, your first question about what if you could trust people and you know know what they're saying is true. It's kind of like there is no blockchain for human interaction, you know, like Yelp isn't you know verifiable, right? Well, and, and that's actually what I was going to do next is uh, what are those benefits oh, you're talking about? Yeah, um, so perfect segue. <laughs> um, I kind of break it into three big buckets of benefits that we will get from blockchain. Um, and, and not to dive in specific solutions. I mean, my company works in the financial part of it and the stock training uh, aspect of things. Um, but uh, there, there's so many ways to solve this problem if you think about it as, as, as truly like a database. Uh, you know, databases are used everywhere for everything. So this will be ubiquitous, just like a database would. Um, but some of the biggest places where we'll have benefits um, is in identification. Uh, knowing that I am who I say I am because I have this proven truth that you can go back to and verify. Um, and that will, time, that will stamp all of my transactions. So when people do transactions on a blockchain network, usually it requires a signature or a digital signature. Um, that signature is my password, my code, my fingerprint, could be anything, what it, uh, however, whatever I use to secure that piece of information. Uh, and once I sign it, that can be verified that it is me and that the asset that I'm dealing with or the transaction I'm doing is verified as well, um, which leads into the second point of commerce. And commerce is just an exchange of anything of value. Um, it can rely to services, goods, um, anything you want that you determine has value. And the, the, what determines value is, is, are the people involved in the exchange? Um, so not the government um, and no one else. If two people want to have a, a, an exchange of value, they can do it and they can do it in a trustless manner, whether they know each other or not, um, through a blockchain type system. Um, you can do it from other sites of the world with different types of money between different types of sources. Um, as long as you can verify the identity or the authentic, authenticity of the asset in hand, um, which is where supply chain, like uh, bottles of wine are being verified with blockchain. This, this bottle was made at this vineyard and at this time and with uh, these processes. 
um, and things like that um, before they go into a supply chain. So you can say, I'm buying that specific bottle and I think that that specific bottle is worth X amount and I can prove that I own that money. And then when I buy it, I can now prove that I have that ownership, um, which makes it the third place where we get a lot of benefit is in legal and auditing. Um, most of our legal debates is what, what did you do? Uh, did, was it you that did it? And can you prove it? Um, and that's what the blockchain provides. And who did it, um, when they did it and what they did, um, and then you can go back and prove it and it can't be changed ever. Um, so it's always there for someone to see. Um, I anticipate people would have some privacy concerns about that. Um, privacy never goes away, but this is actually much safer uh, than the, our current systems, right? If I call my bank and want, they're gonna ask me what my name is, what's my phone number, what's my social security number, last four digits, prove my address or zip code. I have to give them so much information. That's how most people actually get hacked is someone pretending to be their bank and then someone giving the information and then using that on their behalf. Um, so when you cut out all of those things that we used to verify people now, and we go to this more system, and then there's a lot of ways to prove identity that I probably don't have time to get into now, um, but trust me, it's a much safer system to prove identity. And once you can prove you are who you are, you own the things you have, um, and then there's a trail of why you, when did you take ownership of it and when did you give away ownership of it. The land, title, mints, voting is another place where we'll see huge benefits. Um, that is my vote. It is the vote that I made. It's made at a certain time. <laughs> uh, that is the proper way for us to, to move forward in, uh, um, in a lot of different places. And so I kind of stopped there because I think being close to the end of my time and just really reiter reiterate the question um, or the, the goal of what blockchain is going to achieve. And that is to establish trust where there is no trust, um, to allow us to uh, be able to check is COVID real or not, or is someone infected or not, or uh, is this, does this Nigerian prince actually have the money and is who they say they are? Um, and then also, lastly, you can't steal something uh, without leaving a trail on the blockchain. So any stolen asset will, can be returned to the owner. So it actually is a more secure way to hold assets as well. Um, so we're going to see a lot of benefits. And as soon as we start addressing those myths, we'll enter a world where we can trust anyone for almost anything. And I'll stop there. That's amazing. Thank you. That's so much more than I knew before we started on blockchain. Um, I know we have a few more. There were a few more questions posted, but I know we have to move on to the next lecture first. And if you're uh, around when we wrap up, I know you have to leave early. Uh, maybe we can get one of those questions in, and uh, that would be cool if we can. And if not, I totally understand. Uh, thank you for that I'll lecture. Type I'll yes? type some of the answers into these. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, that's so nice of you. Thank you. Um, Great, so you guys, uh, that uh, was our second, we're coming up on our third, which is uh, Don Wright, who is chief scientist of Esri and, profesh uh, sorry, and professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State University. The title of her talk is Scientific Storytelling with Story Maps. And Don, I'm really excited to hear uh, your, your theory and your see your presentation. So thank you for being here. Thank you, Spiro. I'm really, really excited to be here. And I've, I've learned so much already through um, my other two colleagues here. I'm going to share my screen. And I would like to talk about what for many of us is a different type of science communication, a different type of scientific storytelling. And that's the idea of story maps. And I'm going to explain what that is uh, in a couple of minutes. But I first want to just geek out on, on maps. Uh, hopefully everybody in the audience uh, has some affinity to maps. I think maps have always been so amazing uh, for creatives and for writers. And uh, as a map maker myself, I see it as a special type of visual language that communicates to us in special ways beyond words. So I get super excited when I see a great map in the movies or on a TV show, uh, on the news, uh, a lot of weather reports have outstanding maps and they're so communicative. And I think we all know now that we live in this amazing scientific age where we now have access to an overall synoptic view of the entire planet. So uh, oftentimes we can see perils 
uh, in maps in real time. So you just think about a hurricane map. Just think about uh, Henri that's uh, blowing through uh, New England right now or the maps of the flooding uh, in Tennessee. It really, really brings it home. I wanted to, to show this example, which is really powerful because this is an amazing visualization that shows how the earth essentially has lungs and how it breathes seasonally in and out. This is an award-winning visualization by NASA and by Oregon State University. And it shows a Goddard Space Flight Center supercomputer model of uh, carbon dioxide levels. I'm going to rerun that for you. Carbon dioxide levels, those are in reds and oranges. And uh, carbon monoxide is in uh, white in the Earth's atmosphere. So you see that in the southern hemisphere right now. And also the way that the map is moving uh, back and forth in terms of its projection. That is also something that is really, really important uh, in terms of really seeing things in their proper shapes uh, and proportions. So maps really, of course, help us to see the world in a different way spatially. And I would argue that spatial is, is special. We are familiar with latitude and longitude uh, on many geographic information system maps. You see the world in terms of points and lines and areas. We're looking at the Earth's surface, uh, the subsurface, the atmosphere, uh, in outer space, uh, as we'll see with, with Randy coming after me, uh, things on other planets. We are looking at photography now associated with maps and videos and all kinds of other imagery. And spatial lies at the heart of just about everything that matters to us uh, on and in and above the Earth. And uh, just as Justin uh, posed a great question to you, I have a series of, of questions. They're all where, where and how to best sustainably feed a growing population, where to ensure resilient water supplies, where to address hot spots of rapidly declining uh, ocean oxygen or increasing ocean acidification. I'm an oceanographer by, by trade. Where to best establish and enforce additional protected areas both on land and at sea, where to help people to escape from various uh, dangers and injustices. Uh, I won't get into Afghanistan, but there, there are all kinds of spatial uh, issues there. Where to mitigate and adapt to a changing climate. All of these are inherently spatial issues. So I, I would argue that bringing in spatial is one of the best ways of uplifting science for and into your storytelling. But how do we do this? How do we connect uh, a map with an important narrative? Uh, oftentimes, if you start off with once upon a time, uh, you've, you've got your, your audience. And so a lot of us in, in the sciences now are trying to start in a similar way. Once upon a time, uh, there was a bat and a pig. And uh, next thing you know, as, as Jamie uh, laid out for us so, so effectively, maps are ways that you can say once upon a time uh, in a very unusual way. Maps are built from data from spatial data. And I love this quote by uh, a science communication expert uh, named Nancy Barron. She says that stories are data with a soul. And these stories are persuasive uh, and memorable. And I really believe that that is true. In fact, uh, Rush Holt, who is the, uh, the president of the AAAS, has spoken very eloquently on the need for scientists to tell these stories uh, with this soul within them. Uh, not only to tell the story, but to tell the importance of that story, and also to tell the story of the evidence, the story of the question that is to be answered. So this is all a part of science communication, which as we all know is sorely needed now in the public square. And for those of us who are who are map makers and map promoters, 
how do we combine maps with words in, in order to tell a truly compelling uh, story? So this is where the story map comes in. This is a, a new medium for sharing not only maps, but also maps along with associated data, additional data, photos, videos, even sounds, and for telling a specific and compelling story by way of that content. And this is all done with sophisticated cartographic functions that are in an app. You knew I was going to say an app, or maybe you hoped that I was going to say app, because there are series of apps now that help you to do this in, in a matter of minutes or a matter of days. It doesn't require advanced training, and there's built-in functions that help you uh, to, to create these amazing stories. If you're a journalist, if you're a screenwriter, uh, whatever type of, of writing or creative process you're in, uh, I think the story map is very, very compelling. So I'm going to show you several examples in the next few minutes. This one is called Hot Numbers. Uh, it was started as a project by the leader of our story maps team at our company, just to talk to his climate denying relatives, just to give them something compelling, colorful, with some accurate information about why climate change is real and why climate change is something that uh, we are responsible for as humans. What are some of the numbers behind this? So he calls this story map hot numbers. Uh, he's got a narrative introduction here and then he gets into the numbers nine, nine billion. Uh, nine billion uh, people on this planet by 2050. Uh, the story map is also a medium where you can put in all kinds of other graphics, uh, graphs, uh, this curve here showing the rise in human population. Another number, 25. 25% 25 uh, of the Earth's land surface is relatively, relatively free of human impacts. And he has got a compelling map uh, to show this uh, in, the, in that fashion. 1.7. 1.7 Earths to go along with the fact that humanity demands nearly twice as much from the planet than what its ecosystems renew. So it's like the equivalent of using 1.7 Earths. And he's got uh, interactive maps because when you interact with a map, you should be able to, to click on it and to get some information from that area that you've clicked on. So that's uh, one example. Uh, there's one more number, oh, a couple more numbers here, 420 parts per million. Uh, and he's showing the uh, carbon dioxide curve there, 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit, which is what we're headed for in terms of how hot things are going to get. Uh, 17 to 30% uh, of the human population is going to be poorer because of the economic inequalities that are associated with climate change. Eight inches of sea level which leads me to another story map that talks about sea level rise as a specific issue. So this is a story map about coastal flooding uh, and it focuses on Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, it was done by several people who, who work uh, in Virginia in association with NOAA, defining for you what is coastal flooding, what does it look like in different areas around the world. This is a nice combination of, uh, of a map, an interactive map here uh, that you can zoom in on uh, along with an associated beautiful photograph and text. This is about Kiribati or of course we're all familiar with New Orleans and so you can zoom into this inset map uh, to see the, uh, the high resolution imagery, Rotterdam, Bangladesh, other parts of the world. What are the data telling us globally? This is a nice global map that gives you a snapshot in terms of where sea level is rising uh, in the warm colored arrows and where it is falling and what are the, the circumstances and the data behind that, uh, the scientific graphs. Then there are the interactive maps that show you what we are dealing with or what we are going to be seeing very soon this is a 2040 uh, coastal flooding map, so you can swipe between now and 2040 in the future is in the blue to show which areas are going to be uh, experiencing sea level rise. 
uh, of approximately 1.3 feet. And uh, what is happening, particularly in Norfolk, and when we look at uh, the data, again, the inundation data from sea level rise models, what are the facilities that are going to be affected? Not just what areas are going to be flooded, but what kinds of areas? What buildings and roadways are at the highest risk? So that's in the red in this map, followed by orange, impacted by tidal flooding events, and then what kinds of buildings and roadways and facilities are going to be moderately impacted? That's in yellow. So this is using uh, this color scheme to, to bring that point home. And moving forward into 2060, 2080, uh, as, of course things get worse. And uh, specific places that you can zoom to. And then also what can we do? What are some helpful resources to explore this and to learn more? So this is a, a very powerful uh, and you can put all kinds of information uh, in these in these maps, in these story maps. This is a, a story map, which is a series of story maps uh, from uh, an, an atlas uh, that was provisioned. And uh, so it's, it shows you different ways that you can think about conditions uh, around the globe and what that looks like uh, in terms of these uh, infographics but also uh, in terms of what global land use looks like in terms of this, this spinning globe. There are many, many other types of story maps uh, I can show, I could go on for, for a long time. This is about redlining of our cities. This is uh, related to uh, what Jamie was talking to you about in terms of COVID. This is an arrow map which shows the trends uh, in COVID uh, in terms of where you live, are things getting better or are things getting worse? And if we look at uh, California, where, where I live, and I'm in this particular county, uh, 41 days in, in an epidemic trend, strongly worse for seven weeks, and we are not getting uh, any better there. There are certain areas that are a little better. Those are in the oranges. But the, these kinds of maps are also updated with up-to-date data from the CDC and from uh, state and local governments. Uh, you can even get really creative in terms of not using maps particularly. This is a graphic novel that was done with the Story Map app uh, about Map Woman and uh, how data, I would say data are jeopardized, not is jeopardized. Uh, the villains in the story and her, the Map Woman's quest begins and she moves through this really cool graphic novel that is essentially uh, a story map. So uh, I wanted to uh, expose you to some of these, these great uh, resources and uh, a real believer in story maps in terms of geojournalism is James Fallows, uh, who has been writing for the Atlantic for a long time, as, as you know, and he has this particular blog where he's going to be talking more uh, about this geojournalism and about using maps in this very powerful way. And uh, there, there are a lot of things I can put in the chat for you. Uh, this is a resource page about story maps. This is a series of free lessons that you, gives you data, it gives you instructions, it gives you the app for free if you want to try this for yourself. So I'm um, a little bit over time here, but uh, this is what I what I wanted to share, and this is how you can get a hold of me. Thanks. And uh, this is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was really great. Any opportunity, uh, Dawn, for you to put any of the links into the chat would be great. And um, we'll uh, you know swing back. I'm sure there'll be some more Q and A for you uh, when we get to that point. Thanks for doing that. That was really amazing. Um, Next for our uh, final lecture, we're going to have Dr. Randy Wesson. He's at JPL and he's the architecture architecture team lead study architect there. And he uh, his presentation title is The Future of U.S. Robotic Planetary Exploration. And because we had a little bit of a technical issue earlier, um, I'm going to be uh, providing the doing the PowerPoint on my end. So I will be your uh, tech expert or your um my ta 
my TRTA if I can get it together on this end. Hang on one second. So how about I'll start talking, but just put up the first screen if you could. Um, what I'm going to do tonight is give you a little bit of a snapshot of some of the technologies we're working for future exploration of the planet, uh, not only in our solar system, but in other solar systems. Um, I'm only going to go about 30 to 40 years in the future with just a few technologies, because if I do the really weird stuff, that gets to be really science fiction. But uh, what I'm going to do is give you an idea of really what we're working on. So if I have the first slide. Randy, apparently I have to quit Zoom uh, to reboot, to allow it for me to do this. So you keep talking, I'll be right back. So um, while he's doing that, what I'll do is I'll talk about some of the really weird technology that I really like. Um, one example is you've heard of 3D printing, additive manufacturing, where we're looking at 4D printing, where 4D is not time, it's functionality. So the best way to describe it is, you know, your uh, printer on your desk, your normal printer, it's got a magenta cartridge, a cyan cartridge, a black cartridge, and so on. What happens if you have a 3D printer, but rather than having one material, it has a gold cartridge, an aluminum cartridge, a Teflon car cartridge, and so on, so that as it's building up the structure, it's adding the circuitry and everything else, so when you're finished with the print, you've got a functioning device. Basically, it's a replicator. Uh, another idea we're working on is uh, astronomers like really big mirrors. The bigger the mirror, the further you can see, the more distant the objects you can resolve. Well, Hubble is about eight feet across, and that's visible. James Webb, which should be going up the end of this year, that's something like 23 feet across, and that looks in the infrared, because these things are tuned to a different color light. Um, one of the ideas we're looking at to make a really big primary mirror is to make shiny fine grain dust, put the dust, oh, you're in the middle thing. You wanna go back to the beginning. You put the dust in a uh, spacecraft, send the spacecraft between the earth and the moon, dump out the dust. So you have this cloud of dust particles and then either using lasers or electrostatics, there we go, or electrostatics, you shape the cloud into a mirror of any size. It's just a matter of how much dust you have. And for really a lot of fun, if you control the average spacing between the grains, you can tune it to what color light it will reflect. That's the granular imager concept. But now that my presentation's here, let's go back to reality. Okay, so uh, next slide. And thanks to Dawn, I am going to have a map. This is a map of Mars. It's called a Mercator projection. Uh, you got the equator is the black line in the middle. There are some interesting features. You'll notice right through the equator on the left side, there are three white dots. Those are the three shield of volcanoes on Mars. The white dot above the equator, the fourth dot, that's Olympus Mons. That's a volcano that's three times the size of Everest with a footprint the size of Arizona. What's cool about this is they color coded this map. White is the highest, then you get reds and oranges. Yellow would be a baseline reference level. Green and blue are lower down. And you'll notice that the Southern Hemisphere is real reds and oranges. So it's a high plateau with a lot of cratering. The North is, is blue and low down with very few craters. And they color coded this way because we think about 3 billion years ago, Mars had a North Polar Sea. Next slide. Now, one of the things that's entertaining about Mars, oh, you're not in show mode. You're actually, you should be in presentation mode because you should see one and then the other. Well, let's hear the high tech, the larger the wreck. The image on the left, we see these two black dots on the surface. And when we look at close up images of it, those are the two on the right. We see that these are called skylights. Picture a lava tube that flowed billions of years ago on Mars. The tube is now empty, so it's like a subway tunnel. And then what happens, a part of the top of the tunnel caves in forming what we call skylights. There you go, skylights. So next slide. No, no back, and that's, god dang. It's supposed to show those two crater openings. Yes, sorry, Bob. Next. Yeah, there you go. Those are the skylights. And we think the interesting part are the sidewalls, not the tube itself, because the tube would be coated with the last lava flow. 
Next slide. So we're looking at techniques to do that. One of these crawly things that because they're low mass and they've got hooks, they climb walls like geckos and it would be easier on Mars with less of a gravitational pull. Sorry, I couldn't hear what you said. Uh, oh, my watch is talking to me. The next thing is idea is a thing called dual axle. Picture a four-wheeled rover that would lock its back two wheels and then its front axle is on a cable and it drives away without the rover. Next slide. You could do this on the moon and send the axle over the edge and you could look at the stratification of the walls inside that lava tube because each flow would be a recorded history of the sun's activity billions of years ago. Next slide. Well, the Perseverance rover went to Mars and here we have another map in the upper left-hand corner of the Jezero crater where we landed. Next slide. You'll see that white box, that's the area that we landed. That's what it looks like close up. And you can see it, it really looks like a dried, dried riverbed. There's the delta and all that sediments. Sediments and clays are great for holding organics. So maybe this is a way to find the clues of really what was going on Mars three billion years ago when it was wet. Next. Well, this is just for people to remember how we came into Mars. So we come in at about 13,000 miles, we drop the cruise ring, we then use the heat shield for the next four minutes, because from the top of the atmosphere down is seven minutes, that's why we call it seven minutes of terror. We streak it across the sky in four minutes, we heat up to about 3,000 degrees. Once we slow up, out comes a hypersonic parachute. That slows us down to about 200 miles an hour. That's still too fast to land. It's just that the atmosphere isn't that thick enough to really slow up that parachute. So what we do is we drop the heat shield. There goes the heat shield exposing the rover that's exposed underneath. We then drop the rover that's wearing basically a jet pack. Once we get close to the ground, it lowers itself down on a cable and then the sky crane gently places on the ground at about a touchdown rate of about one to two miles per hour. And so it looks simple, it's very scary, but we lower it down and then we just park this thing on the ground. Once we're down, we cut the cables and then the, 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 the descent stage just, uh, I mean, the sky crane just goes and crashes up to the side. So that's how Perseverance got there. Now, oop, back one. You go a little fast. Okay, so one of the technology demonstrations that should be playing is we dropped a helicopter down called Ingenuity. This was just an experiment. And what this thing was supposed to do is see if we could demonstrate higher than, heavier than air flight. We were only supposed to do five technology flights. It was so successful. We've already done 12 of these things. And now we're learning how the rover and the helicopter can work as a pair, where basically the helicopter can go over terrain, the rover can't. It can scout safe paths and it can look for interesting things, you know, maybe like a femur sticking out. But uh, the ingenuity has been really successful. And some of the things that we're doing is where this was a four pound helicopter, we're now looking at uh, 60 pound helicopters for future Mars missions. But it, it works like a champ, which is really very nice. Next slide. So there's a picture of Ingenuity on the ground, and that's an actual footage of that dual prop helicopter on the surface. Next. Um, this is a surface of Mars, but if you hit the next bar, you'll see a red circle. That is where Ingenuity is flying. And later on, I'm going to put in an animation of that. But the real job for the Perseverance is this. Next. This is step one, and that should be a movie. You may have to, there you go. It's to collect samples for future vehicles to collect. So the way this thing works is we stick out our arm, we drill a core sample in what we think is an interesting sample. So it's not a drill, it's a core. It's pulling out a whole plug of the surface of Mars. We pick up the plug, we put it inside our carousel, so there's the carousel, we, we put it in there. Then we rotate the thing around to the bottom. There's actually a second arm and that arm picks up that sample, 
that's been posited, it then moves it over to a device because we want to see what we got. So this is a device where we stick this sample in there and it does the following. It'll measure how much stuff we have there. It'll seal it and we image each step and then we move it over for storage. And we have like 43 tubes. We'd like to get over 30 samples and we're gonna put them on the surface for a future vehicle to go and collect. But that's the primary job for Perseverance. Next. We're going on to uh, Jupiter. So that's Jupiter in the background. There's the moon Europa. We have a mission called Europa Clipper, which should be launching in October, 2024. In this image in the foreground is one of the moons of Jupiter called Europa. And the reason why we love Europa, next, is Europa has a ice crust that is anywhere between five to 10, 15 miles thick, we believe. And then it's got a subterranean liquid water ocean that we believe is either probably about at least two times the amount of liquid water under this crust than all the oceans on the earth combined. And so we asked the scientists, if you were gonna climb, if you were gonna explore somewhere in this ocean, where would you go? Would you drive along the bottom and looking at hydrothermal vents? Would you swim like a fish? Or would you try to be by the ice water interface? And they said the ice water interface because convection cells could bring things up to the ice and radiation from Jupiter would radiate the surface causing interesting stuff to fall into the ocean. So we started working on this. Next slide. We went to Alaska, we found a frozen lake, we pull out the ice plug and then we take out this little device that we call Brewy we brought it over to the hole. First, we dumped in some cameras looking up at the hole. We turn it on and then it starts driving. But the fun thing about Bruy is the spacecraft, the rover is buoyant. So it drives along the bottom of the ice. Now let's face it, you still have to figure out how to get it 500 million miles out to Jupiter. You still got to figure out how to go from five to, to 15 uh, miles of ice. You still got to get the thing down there. You got to figure out how to get powers and command to it. You got to figure out how to get data out of it. But we're starting. Um, another idea was how do you get to the bottom? And they said, why don't you go through the crevasses, the splits in the ice? So we're working on this next thing. Next slide. You may have to hit the space bar to get it to move. There you go. You would land this thing on. Encellus, this is now Saturn, you would be next to some of these jets and you have a tether with this thing called EELS, Exobiology Extent Life Surveyor, co-rotating segments that would go to the edge of the cliff, sniff what's coming out, and then it will spiral down because it's got pressure sensors that always keep it pegged to the walls as it Archimedes spirals into this crevasse to see how far it can go. And one of the things we'd be looking for was would there be life. Next, because I'm running out of time. We also, oop, back one. The guys at, at uh, John Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory is working on a helicopter for Dragonfly. And there's some really cool stuff about Titan, but I'm running out of time. Next. Uh, we're looking for planets around other stars. The latest one is called TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. Next. We see things like hot Jupiters. Picture a planet the size of Jupiter that has a year around its star that's one or two Earth days long. That's why we call them hot Jupiters, because they're in so close, they're really hot. Next. We've also seen things, orphan worlds. Picture Jupiters that get thrown out of their solar system, and they're just floating through interstellar space by their lonesome. And then finally, next, and you're gonna have to click on this to get the movie to play. Ba oh, back one, back one, back one. Ah! Can you just there, click on that? Based on the density arguments, we find worlds that look like they're ocean worlds, just like the movie. It's just completely covered with liquid water on the surface. And those are places we also find very interesting to, to explore. But one of the challenges we have is the light from the central star is so bright compared to that that's reflected off of the planet. It's like 10 billion to one. So we need to make a mechanical thumb of sorts to put the thumb over the star to block the light 
so we can see the light next to it. Basically, this task is trying to see a firefly an inch away from a, a lighthouse when you're a mile away. And because of dust in both systems, it's on a foggy night. So here's the mechanical thumb we're working on. Next. This is called Starshade. You get the telescope on the right. You first do the single deploy, then you do a second deploy, and this could be 15, 20, 25 feet, depending on how far you want to go. The edges of the pedals are particularly designed to suppress light, so when it gets to its operational distance, the telescope will watch it, and then the star shade moves, this is the thumb, in front of the star, so you can directly see exoplanets around other star systems. That's star shade. Next. Yep, I got to wrap it up here. Uh, we're doing this basically because we want to find new Earths. Next. We do this for three reasons. We want to explore the universe. We want to understand our standard planet. And basically, the technology helps us improve our lives. Next, I just want to end with a set of four pictures. On the left, that's Earth as seen from low Earth orbit. The one in the middle is Earthrise. That's the Earth as seen from the moon. On the right, if you click it one more, you'll get a circle. That is that white dot, that is the Earth as seen from the surface of Mars. And then finally, next slide. Here we're looking at the back of Saturn. So the sun is in front of Saturn. You can see the rings glowing. The red dot, the red circle, there's a dot in there. That's Earth from a billion miles away. So I'd like to end with a quote by one of my heroes, Konstantin Advodorovich Tsiolkovsky. The Earth is the cradle of the mind, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. Thank you. That was amazing. Thanks for that. Um, Thanks for having me. You guys, we uh, ran a little bit over with the lectures. I know we had some uh, difficulty uh, getting started, but uh, uh, Greg, we have time for questions, correct? And yeah, I don't we see can go any... 10, Yeah, we can go 10, 15 minutes later since we started a few minutes late. That's fine. OK. Um, I'm just not seeing your text about that. Uh, all right, so we don't have any open Q&A, but uh, welcome to have some Q&A, folks. We still have some, we still have four, one, two, three, four, five of our people. So Randy's here. That was a great uh, lecture. Uh, Don, Randy, Jamie, thank you. Anyone want to post in the Q&A? Or do I get to ask all my questions? Um, Go for so, it. So, <laughs> um, Randy, you and Don, the work that you have each been doing separately, and I don't know if you guys have ever worked together or know each other or anything, but it's really one just conceptually, it's interesting to see uh, both of you telling these stories using maps, you know, and uh, in one way or another, one certainly Earth focused and one, you know, interplanetary focused. But I thought that that was pretty cool uh, that you can use maps and that you can bring story from that and what like a map means nothing unless we know you know what's there and what we can use it for you know it can tell the story of, of many people I just thought that was interesting and one of the things I would tell you and this is thanks to Dom too and you the writer community we use the storytelling approach that Pixar uses once upon a time uh, every day one day because of that because of that, until finally to get our scientists to communicate because they're great at proposals and writing technical jur uh, journal articles. They're not as strong really communicating to the public of why I should care about this mission. And Dawn, that, your stuff is great. Oh, that is so true. We, we use a similar approach to, to help our users tell stories, many of whom are scientists. And we, we use uh, the hero's journey as well as the Pixar yes. approach. Yeah. 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 Awesome. And uh, Randy, I'm so glad to, to meet you. Uh, your, your colleagues at GPL worked with our uh, solution engineers and our cartographers uh, at Esri to produce a virtual spinning globe and interactive uh, site of, of Mars. Oh uh, yeah, so, it's a lot of fun. So I put that uh, in the chat and uh, it, was, it was just amazing. Thank That's you. awesome. I love that. Um, first, I love the two of you meeting during this <laughs> during this program, and that it's so fascinating to hear scientists tell uh, that they're using, you know, documents and books, you know, like the the writers 
you know, way uh, to tell their stories. And I think it is important for scientists to be able to get these stories out and how they relate to people. We had some great uh, Q&As pop up. Uh, Alyssa's asking robots or humans on Mars? I guess like, which do you think we'll send first or which is the best way to go, Randy? Well, you can say right now that Mars is a planet that's inhabited by robots. So that's kind of cool. But um, I believe you send robots for the routine exploration, continual mapping stuff. You know, you have hardware and software. We call humans wetware. You only bring in the wetware when you really need the creativity and the spontaneity to really explore the stuff. So I would continue using robotics as our ambassadors until we realize there's a reason for humans to be there. Will we someday have a, um, a Mars live stream? Like right now you can watch the Paris live stream or? Yeah, the challenge is it's gonna be anywhere from four to 21 minutes one way. So the conversation is gonna be slow. Yeah. Um, I know people want copies of your, uh, of your documents. Uh, they want your info. I think it's best to go through uh, this uh, science and entertainment exchange unless you guys feel um, otherwise, sure. um, you know, you guys can reach them through that. Uh, in terms of Mars settlement, what are the biggest hurdles and or challenges facing the current space programs? Money. Well, first of all, it's really the will to do so. You know, I believe the really reason why you send people anywhere is unfortunately, if there's an economic reason for doing it. The Apollo program caved in under its own weight because after beating the Russians to the moon, there was no economically viable reason for doing that. And what's really going on is if you look at the space exploration, first you had uh, you know weather satellites, communication satellites, GPS satellites. Uh, we always thought of remote sensing, we always thought material processing would be next, but it looks like humans will actually, and entertainment will actually go next in terms of commercial and space. So I tell my kids that they're the last generation of humans to look up at the moon and go, quote, I remember when there were no city lights on that. And great that's title. That's a great start to a book right there. That sense. Yeah. Um, you guys and Don, if you uh, wanted to start this, uh, what stories would each of you like to see get told out there to inspire interest in science? Obviously, you've told your stories, but I'm just curious if this is an opportunity for you to bring up other stories that you're interested in. There are so many stories. One of the things that we're, we're doing right now uh, in collaboration with the National Geographic is a storytelling competition for uh, young people, uh, high school students through undergraduate. And we are encouraging them to tell uh, stories of their own places, of uh, their own, uh, the science that they might be interested in, the science that they want to do, uh, the science that is needed. Uh, in, in their area uh, and with so many uh, climate change effects everybody is focused on this now in terms of how places have gotten hotter uh, what's happened with uh, the water quality uh, if you want to look up into the sky to dream about going to Mars or Europa what places can you go to to see the stars based on uh, air quality and uh, the population which uh, drowns out the night sky. So all of these kinds of, of uh, this is a contest that, that just started. So I, I think that's, that's cool. one thing. Yeah, I love that. Um, Jamie, I think you're still uh, with us. I know you have your uh, camera off, uh, but I had, uh, I wonder if she's still there. I could ask a question. Maybe she'll, she'll be back. Um, other questions? Are you looking for questions? I was looking for questions and I don't see any. So um, now I, I'm back to you guys. Uh, I think that we may, Jamie may be tied up uh, there at the ho at home, but um, uh, what do either, since again, more map questions, both of you work in that area of mapping, uh, the Earth. What about all of our space junk? Can I know we map that to a degree? Can we get a get like something that just goes and eats it all up? We are looking at techniques to do that, but it's uh, we've had a first I won't say a first major disaster, but a Chinese satellite was taken a commission 
because he just got hit by a Russian booster about mm. six months ago, which also oh, wow. makes more debris. But um, yeah, I mean, we have serious problems with, with that debris. But to get back to your early point in terms of the stories you should make, Robert Goddard, the father of astronautics, said, the dreams of yesterday are the hopes of today and the reality is tomorrow. So just take your compelling stories and put them in a different environment. In Titan, where the rain falls slow, where you have Grand Canyons five miles high on, uh, on Mars, or Io that has the most volcanically erupting place in the solar system, or Neptune that has the windiest winds. In the, I mean, so there's all these different places you do. Just take your great stories and put it in a different environment. Yeah, that's cool. Um, yeah, Jamie, I had a question. I was just going to uh, ask you a, a general, more general question about vaccines and how people perceive science. So often, you know, like you had mentioned earlier about the masks and how it was, oh, you're, the masks aren't useful. Well, we were trying to save the masks for the people who are on the front line. Um, but people get into their head that like science is this, you know, certainly uh, vaccine vir vir virology and all that is, it's very static. And like, it's just the one thing and it never changes. And if and any of you and um, Jamie in particular, I wanted to see what you thought about how hard or challenging it is to impress upon the, sub the public in general, that science is something that is tested and changes as new things are discovered. Yeah, you bring up a couple of really interesting points, Siro, because the, the first element is the current distrust of science and scientists that, of course, if you're in the field, is really tough. And I also completely understand how that distrust happens when you have a reputable organization like the Center for Disease Control for the U.S., saying you don't need masks because they need to conserve the supply because there'll be a crisis, right? So folks are not able to get reliable information all the time. And, you know, when we talk about, you know, what stories do us scientists or those in the field want to tell, I think just continuing to tell that story about how science actually happens. And, you know, we go into this because we have an interest and an integrity and a correctness and an accuracy behind what we do. So the vast, vast majority of scientists are very honest people seeking the truth in their data and experiments. Which leads us to the second part of your question, um, which is the, the evolution of, of science and the ongoing experiment. It takes many years, sorry for my toddler. It gets many, okay. many years for uh, of medicine to get to market and that's because it is just completely vetted out somebody wants to call her right now <laughs> uh, it's just completely vetted out um, through so many elements of lab trials whether it's clinical testing or trying it with um, simulations in the lab or finally in humans so even these emergency authorization vaccines you know, a, a lot of folks are waiting until it's it's formally approved because they think that's safer. But actually, this the vaccine has gone into an unprecedented, unprecedented number of millions of people of different ages, ethnicities, um, health conditions. So it's it's safer than most vaccines from that perspective. So, uh, and yes, ongoing research into. Um, variants and um, ensuring that the medicines stay up to date. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, it does. And um, you guys are uh, absolutely happy to hear from Randy and Don as well. One of the things I was going to add is I remember when they first were like, in I think December, like, oh, this vaccine's coming out, you know, and it's going to happen for people in healthcare first and all that. I even remember thinking, gosh, that's really fast. Like, is that going to be okay? Because, you know, I didn't know that this is work that has been done. Like we were talking about that Wired article. Um, this is work that, you know, it's the work on the COVID vaccine was paved by HIV research. And now it's going, the work that what we've learned is going back into HIV research. And I just think that's really interesting that I wish we could get that type of information out to the public more. And I know you guys aren't public policy, but I'm just curious what you um, thought about that. 
I think the vaccines are one of the most amazing accomplishments in all of science, what has happened in the, in the last year. It's absolutely uh, un unbelievable. Uh, what, yeah. and, and it's been an international effort. It hasn't been one lab uh, in one country. It, it has been a global, it, there's, it's been a race actually. And I, I, as a scientist, I have been so proud to see that. And I try to, to tell uh, colleagues and neighbors, and uh, I think a lot of this comes down to one-on-one to -on -one conversations too. Uh, as we, we, we try to communicate this, sometimes we, it feels rather hopeless because uh, there's so much misinformation out there. Uh, there's so much lying uh, out there. There's so many forces that are trying to, uh, so much insanity uh, that you, as, as a scientist, I get really discouraged sometimes, but yeah. uh, it's, it's a day by day, person by person, uh, labor of love. Yes. Um, I, what we need is a blockchain identifier for all of this yeah. information that's out on Facebook. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, we have, one, yeah, go ahead. One of the problems is that people used to say something that has, was tangentially related to the truth. And now there's total disregard for the truth. Matter of fact, I was in a lecture and somebody wanted to know what an alternate fact was. And I'm going, an alternate fact? There is no such thing as an alternate fact. A fact is something based on observable. You can have an interpretation of the fact, but a fact is a fact. And somehow our educational system, well, we're just getting bombarded by so much stuff. It's, you can't blame any one thing because there is really great information out there, but it sometimes gets lost in the noise of everything else. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I think we have two final questions. Uh, what recent, uh, speaking of feeling like it's, it's hopeless sometimes, what recent innovations have given you the most hope for the future? Who are you addressing that to? Uh, either of you, both of you, sorry. If I had to throw out something, I love 3D printing, not just for 4D printing. They already had a kid that was 17 years old with a bad bladder. They took out some of his bladder cells. They grew them in a Petri dish. They put it on a scaffolding. They used a biological printer and they reprinted a bladder organ and they put it back in the kid and it's working fine. And they say, you know, we're really good at hollow organs. It's the filled ones we still have problems with. <laughs> but we're making body parts. So, I mean, it, it's yeah. just nuts. <laughs> I didn't know that story. That's fascinating. It is nuts. And I love what Randy was saying about 4D uh, printing. printing. Yeah. Oh, gosh. But but I think, uh, yeah, I work for a technology company and we're always looking for technical innovations, uh, software. I work for a software company. But one of the things that I've seen uh, in my company and in my industry uh, is the diversity and inclusion factor. To me, that is the innovation that gives me hope because the diversity uh, factor in terms of women and people of color, uh, people of different uh, orientations, backgrounds, that increases the likelihood or the probability that the answer or the solution is in the room. And then mm -hmm. the inclusion, if we're including all of those voices, that increases the likelihood or the probability that we get the answer or the solution or the innovation on the table and out there. So uh, running the gamut of printing, artificial intelligence, uh, the all of the uh, amazing uh, genetic work uh, that Jamie was talking about, the blocked, all of that to me comes down to the, the innovation of getting the right people, not the right people, but the most diverse and inclusive uh, environments into into our labs and workspaces. Yeah, it's Along very similar to the writer's room. Dawn, I was going to say, we no longer can solve problems with just one person in one discipline thinking about the problem. Yeah, exactly. Looking for life. You can't do that with one person. You geologists, you physicists, you people from all backgrounds, because these are tough problems. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, a really great way to think about it. Um, I, I final question from Alyssa's, uh, Randy, what would an ocean's planet, planet's atmosphere be like, varied, I imagine? Well, for our understanding, it would not have an atmosphere. You'd have a liquid water ocean with an ice crust that might occasionally vent, but there would be no atmosphere above the ice, because we typically find these things on, on moons of other worlds. 
Oh, awesome. Interesting. Okay. Um, you guys, this has been an amazing hour and a half of science for our brains. Uh, everyone, please give them a big round of applause at home. Uh, Jamie, Don, Randy, thank you so much for your time. And thanks for doing this. It was, and it was great to see you again. And uh, everyone have a great night.